talk about, there we go. Okay. Now we're going. All right, so let's talk about gene regulation. So I honestly think this is one of our hardest topics. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I do agree. I was like, <laughs> okay. I didn't know what you were And so that's one of the things that we are gonna go over on Thursday, and Maggie, I printed you the copy of how to walk through this. So this is what I want us to think about. I want us to think about the big idea of what's happening. So gene expression. How does a gene become a protein? We've learned about transcription and translation. And what we've learned, there's a section of DNA, it gets transcribed into mRNA, it gets translated into a protein. So that's sort of like the perfect functioning system. What I want us to think about is when we learned about cell communication. And we use signal, transduction, response. Now we are at the response where a cell is given a signal, so an extracellular clue, so a hormone, some protein, something, that enters the cell through second messengers, et cetera, the transduction that goes into the nucleus and goes to a promoter region of DNA. So this is a region of DNA that, does that is not transcribed or translated. It's merely a starting place for transcription factors to attach that then start the transcription and translation process. So what this signal starts is a series of events to start transcription at this promoter region. Because in the whole sequence of DNA, only one gene needs to be made right now. That's the point, to make one gene of, you know, 500 to 10,000 base pairs, that's all that's needed. And so these signals are what get us to that one place. So this is really like, what I want us to think about is how does the cell know what DNA to transcribe and translate? And so that's the signal. And when it says increase or decrease the expression, to increase the expression is to make more copies of the protein. So sometimes the signal will be to make many, many copies. So we are keep translating that mRNA sometimes to decrease to make less copies, Maggie. So there are a lot of um, genes on DNA. Yes. And a regulatory sequence is just pulling that one gene out? Yes, but you don't pull the gene out. It stays attached to the DNA. But yeah, but yes. you're copying only that part. And the regulatory sequence is the part of DNA that's not necessarily transcribed but it's where that process starts. So not every base in DNA is necessarily transcribed and translated into a protein. Pieces of DNA also are, serve as attachment positions. That's what the promoter region is, this region of DNA for attachment of transcription factors. So are there like multiple stop codons in a strand of DNA. We're not even at stop codons. Remember, stop codons are only in mRNA. Then how does it know to stop? Like transcribing. So Just because there's another place where it says, all right, the mRNA is finished. So just like there's a promoter region, there's a region that shows that this is the end of the gene. Wait, what would be like an example of increasing or decreasing? Of the expression of the um, we're going to get to one about the last operon, but um, think about like positive and negative feedback systems. So when we're talking about women going into labor, when they're in the labor, the uterus contracts, releasing the oxytocin, and oxytocin then um, signals the release of more oxytocin, so that becomes a positive feedback loop. So that presence of oxytocin would increase the expression to make more of that hormone. Okay. Okay. So. So now we are looking at regulatory proteins. So we have proteins, regulatory proteins. We have transcription factors. 
and other media type of protein. And so what you need to know is that the, the controlling element, the transcription factors, etc., they can be on other parts of the DNA. They call it um, upstream, so sort of behind the gene, so the gene A. This is where it's, this is what's actually transcribed. The promoter is what needs the attachment of the transact the transcription factors, but those are controlled by other sequences of DNA upstream or before that gene. And so what we see a lot, and we're gonna do an activity with this next week with eukaryotic organisms, is the way that the DNA can bend or fold to attach to the promoter region. And so what I need you to know is not the specific proteins or activators or transcription factors, I need you to recognize that they exist and that the failure of any of these to exist, to be inhibited, to be blocked, if they are denatured or damaged, and any of these different factors are not present and working, that the RNA polymerase cannot attach to the promoter region, and then this gene will not be transcribed and translated. So all of these little pieces are needed so that the RNA polymerase can attach to the promoter to transcribe the DNA. This is really important is that the way the expression of genes, so the fact that all of these factors allow RNA to attach is what give us the phenotypic differences. And sometimes, because our DNA can have multiple genes in the same area, it's which factors are being activated so that that gene is expressed over another one. What exactly is like the picture showing? So it's showing that here, this is a strand of DNA, here's the gene of interest, gene A. Right before the gene of interest is the promoter region. That's where RNA polymerase attaches to add the RNA bases. And in order for RNA polymerase to attach to the promoter, we need these other proteins that are called transcription factors or mediator proteins to then attach the promoter. And the reason they attach is because of more DNA upstream of the gene called the enhancer region. And so when this region is activated, it causes these transcription factors to attach here that then folds the DNA so that the RNA polymerase can attach to the promoter. So I really want you to think about this like the game mouse trap or a Rube Goldberg machine, we have all of these actions to make one action. And the one action is that this gene is transcribed. So just like we have positive and negative feedback, we can have positive and negative regulatory molecules. So in positive regulation, you have a molecule called an activator. And when the activator is attached to a section of DNA as is a promoter called an operator, RNA polymerase can attach, transcription can occur. So we need this molecule, something to activate the transcription. When there is no activator, there is no transcription. So again, if you're reading this on a multiple choice question or FRQ, you would probably be looking at what is the impact of having an activator or not. Negative regulation deals with a repressor. So in negative regulation, if there is a repressor attached to the operator, RNA polymerase cannot attach and we cannot have transcription. But when the repressor is removed, we can have transcription. And whether or not a gene has positive or negative regulation would just depend on the type of gene and that type of signal pathway. You would have to be told that. But you could determine if there is a molecule on the operator and no transcription, that would be negative regulation. But if there is a molecule on the operator and there is transcription, 
It's positive. Maybe. Um, so, to the left, those are going to be genes that need an activator yes. to, to transcribe. Yes. So when it's not there, they're not going to transcribe. Correct. But the genes on the right are a totally different type of gene. Correct. That would need a repress, that would be inhibited by a repressor. Correct. So they could only transcribe one there. Correct. So it's, it's never going to be the same gene. It's either or. Correct. Okay. okay. So then gene expression. We do some have neither active or activators or repressors. I would imagine so. Some could just do it. This is not very clearly simple here. <laughs> this is not a simple process. So here is another picture of the one we saw two slides ago. So it's showing us that um, because every cell in an organism has the exact same DNA, obviously only certain genes are used. And that's why we need these activators the repressors, the enhancers, all to determine what DNA is actually transcribed. Or is this as turned on? Turned on means activated to turn on. And then this activation is what gives us the protein that gives us the phenotype. So this has a little bit more detail. So we see the long strands of DNA. And if we look at the DNA, we have our gene right here. But before we get to the gene, we have all these other parts of the DNA strand sequence that are used to determine whether or not that piece of DNA is transcribed. So we have a place where repressors could attach. So if that repressor attaches, will transcription occur? No. Correct. So then we have an enhancer region. So this needs an activator. So if this activator attaches, can transcription occur? Yes. So it's like steps. Correct. So if this activator attaches to an enhancer region, what that does, you can see this has co-activators. So again, even more molecules that need to keep coming together in this sort of cascade of events. So the activator attaches to an enhancer region. We have another molecule that attaches to the activator, that attaches to the mediator, that attaches to different proteins or transcription factors. And all of this is so that the enzyme RNA polymerase can attach to the promoter region so that the RNA polymerase will then move along the actual gene to make that mRNA strand. Maggie. So obviously in uh, transcription, the RNA polymerase is moving along, yes. like, like left to right, you could say, like yes. sliding down the DNA strand. Yes. But, but up top, like when you're getting those repressor and enhancer uh, yes. regions, are you, are, are the molecules like just kind of doing that all at once, getting ready for transcription, or are they also, oh, if there's a repressor, then they go to the enhancer, like. Is it like sliding down that DNA still? It's not so much sliding, and what we see is this isn't moving down here in this gray area. It's more of a folding and bending to activate the promoter region. So it's kind of happening all at once, yes. and then it starts moving. Yes. Okay. So like if one step goes wrong, none of this can happen? Correct. Oh, just like a cell cycle. Yes. Yes. So at this point, I mean, this is the end of our molecular genetics. So thinking about what we studied in the cell, how long we were still in the cell, of cell communication and the cell cycle and all of these different processes. So then, it, to make things more fun, is because of RNA processing, because of the inclusion of introns, or I'm sorry, excluding the introns, using exons, and those exons can be removed and added to give us different genes from the same sequence of DNA. 
So from what this slide, what I really want you to think about is if this is the original strand of DNA, depending how this RNA is spliced, you can get all of these different DNA sequences, so different genes. Does it know which one to code for? It knows by what activator signals and transcription factors are received. So, so it's going through the DNA and act, if some activators are not activated and then some repressors appear, then that's what's going to like, like, uh, I guess, show which segments are actually going to be transcribed. Yes. So can it like skip a region that like an activator didn't appear and then transcribe like like a different gene? Yes. A different region. Yes. Yes. Are those activator and and uh, repressors like only for like for a specific gene? The whole thing? Yes. Or are they throughout a gene? That's a good question that I don't know if I know the answer to. Is every gene activated by a specified set of activators that are used for any other gene? I don't know. Or like, is there just one for each gene? Yeah, like you're talking about like enzymes and like how they have like one function. I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. But they do know if, if you start studying like the molecular causes of diseases what you get into is it's like a defect in this randomly named protein with numbers and letters and the damage of that protein causes a cascade of things that either do or do not happen causing the symptoms we know of as that disease um, so when you get deep into the molecular biology of it, you start to learn the names of these activators. And we're just that we are just calling proteins or transcription factors. They do have names and numbers, and a lot of them have been identified for their specific jobs. But we're talking more of general effects, obviously. So epigenetics. Epigenetics we touched on before, and it's how DNA is changed, the expression is changed. So the DNA is the same, but how that DNA is expressed, those phenotypes, how it's, so expression we now know is what is transcribed based on modification, and that's using basically different RNA splicing. Um, all right, operons, let's get through these in five minutes. So, an operon we see in prokaryotic organisms. So, next week we'll talk about gene regulation in eukaryotic organisms, but in prokaryotic organisms, we have these groups, like operon, think of like operators, like working together. So these are closely linked genes that produce an mRNA molecule that are controlled by the same regulatory sequence. So we can see up here, the genes, but here is the parts of the DNA that codes for whether or not those genes are actually producing these proteins. And so we have the regulatory genes and then the operator that can inhibit or promote. So it can either stop the transcription or start the transcription. And so the one we talk about the most often is the lack operon. So how does a bacteria cell break down lactose into glucose? And the reason this has been studied is this in E. coli, and E. coli is what's called a model organism, so it's used very, very often by scientists, so a lot is known about it. So the whole E. coli genome is sequenced, and what scientists are constantly doing is figuring out how does that sequence, what genes does it make? And this is by turning genes on and off, and changing the regulatory proteins. Wait, isn't that E. coli, isn't that like bad for you? Isn't it in water that makes you sick or something? Yeah, yeah, it can make you sick. But in the lab, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the last opera. So it's usually
actually turn off. So when it's turned off, you have the regulatory, the regulatory proteins bound to the operator, so that's repressed. So we will not make the lac Z, lac Y, or lac A genes. So usually this is normal since the repressor is attached, so the gene is not transcribed. And honestly, when I think about a lot of genes, that's more often the case. More often the case, genes don't need to be made or transcribed or to be made. So this is what happens. So for the lac operon, so now we're going with specific. So when there is no lactose, the, the bacteria does not need to release proteins to break down lactose, right? It's about efficiency. If there is no lactose, why does the cell need to make something to break down lactose? So when lactose is present, this allolactose, which is another protein molecule, it binds to the repressor. When this binds to the repressor, the repressor detaches from the operator. And so now that the operator is free, the RNA polymerase can bind to the operator and can transcribe these three genes that break down lactose into glucose. But then when lactose is no longer present, because these proteins have broken down the lactose, the allolactose will no longer be attached to the repressor and the repressor will reattach to the operator. So what this shows is that when these genes are only made in the presence of lactose. And scientists did this by growing bacteria on um, like lactose rich um, auger. So bacteria only had lactose as the food source. So they had to uptake lactose, convert it into glucose to complete fermentation for ATP. Is lactose what's in dairy? Yeah. It's a, just another type of carbohydrate. Oh, it's not a sugar. Oh, it is. A, all carbohydrates are sugar. Yeah. Okay. Questions? All right. Maggie, fly safe.